Now, our next witness would wish to be known as Leroy, would he? Leroy, yes. Leroy. Leroy Byrne Scarlet. Please hold the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Leroy, in July 1982, you had surgery to your knee. Um, because a, a rather large piece of glass had become lodged in it. Is that yeah, right? That's correct. Um, they'll come up on the screen in front of you in a moment, I hope, some photos of the scarring. It's 2644007, please, Paul. Yeah. And we can get a sense in particular from the bottom right-hand photograph of the size of the scar to your knee. Yeah. And that's the only time you've ever had surgery? Only time, yeah. And um, it's your understanding and belief that in the course of that surgery, you were given a blood transfusion? Some form of blood, yeah. yeah. Now, we'll come back later in your evidence as to the, the basis for your belief, okay? okay. But just to, what we established that in, as part of the chronology. Now, you remember you were in hospital for some 10 days or two weeks following the operation, is that right? Yeah, approximately so, yeah. And after the operation... You underwent regular rehabilitation treatment for that knee yeah. for a period of some months or a year. It wasn't quite a year, it's about it's a couple of months because I, I lived quite a distance from where the accident happened. I live in Nottingham and it happened in Manchester. So I found difficulty getting the rehabilitation to Manchester. Now, from about 1984, you began to experience some physical symptoms, stomach problems, tiredness, restless legs, insomnia. What can you tell us about those symptoms? Yeah, um, it, it wasn't strong, strong, but it built up where I'd be sweating, uh, my legs I couldn't keep still at night, itchy legs, stomach, especially stomach pains. And I, I repeatedly went to the doctor, then I eventually was put down for a beer and meal and such. And nothing from that. But. It was only many years later in July 2009 that you learnt that you had hepatitis C. Yeah. And if we just have on screen, please, Paul, 2644002. And we can see there the date of the sample, bottom of the page is 9th of July 2009. And we can see positive confirmatory hepatitis C results. Yeah. You were told that diagnosis by your GP. Yeah. And you describe it in your statement as, as a bombshell and a life-changing shock. Can you elaborate on that a little? Yeah, because um, I'd always tried to be healthy. I had no tattoos, no piercings. I tried to keep myself as healthy, as fit as I possibly can, could. And uh, to find out that I'd... As far as I was aware, you had to be injecting drugs or something to, to get hepatitis C, because that's the only information that seems to be out there. So it was a bombshell to me, because, uh, as I said, I've never had an operation, I've never, I've never broken a bone. I'm quite healthy, or I thought I was quite healthy. And uh, to find out that I had hepatitis C, and there's not much information about it, but it was like, where did that come from, type of thing. And can you recall the point in time at which you put two and two together and realised that it might have been due to the surgery you'd had in 1982. Was that then or was that later? That was, that was later, right, because I'd, I'd been inquiring, trying to find out where I could have possibly got the uh, virus. And I was um, <clears throat> discounted, like, we don't know type of thing. And it was only when I was at the clinic for... Um, the, the hepatitis C that I found out that there's um, payments that you can get or if you're part of that person, if you're a person that you think you were infected and with all the symptoms and all the criteria, I thought I was that person. So I applied to, for my records 
And when I got my records, there was nothing in my records. From 1982 to 1986, there was a blank. And that was exactly when I had the operation and when I had the rehab. And there was nothing. <clears throat> we'll, we'll come back to your records in a, in a few minutes, um, Leroy. Just sticking with, with you being told about the hepatitis C infection, were you given any uh, information or adequate information about the infection at that time? No, not at all. What you've said in your witness statement is you felt that you were left in the dark. Yeah. It was frightening and it made you feel anxious. Yeah. Now, you've um, subsequently seen in your medical records an entry from 2003, so six years before you were given the diagnosis. And we'll just have that up on screen. It's 2644005. And it's the first entry for the 12th of May 2003. It's not very clear. It seems to say blood test something, LFTS, liver function tests, abnormal. And it might say wants hepatitis test. And it's, we've got hepatitis C written across. Was there any discussion with you, as far as you are aware or can recall, in 2003 about the possibility that you might have hepatitis C? Not at all. And your... Sorry, carry on, anyway. No, no, no. It was only, I only became aware of that when I got my records, and that's six years later. And you're concerned that that may show that there was a significant delay of some six years in yeah. you being either properly tested or given the diagnosis of hepatitis C. Yeah. And that, you say very candidly in your statement, that's made you angry, because yeah. had you known earlier, you might have been able to have treatment earlier or take steps to ensure that you were living as healthily as you could. Yes, yeah. Information is, is key, you know. Now, the hepatitis C having been diagnosed in 2009, your GP referred you to hospital for treatment. Yeah. And you underwent treatment with interferon and ribavirin, but that stopped after 12 weeks because you weren't responding. Yeah, it wasn't working. Because I had to take the... You had an injection, and I didn't know how to inject it, and sometimes it won't work, so it didn't work for that reason, I do believe. And what were the side effects of that treatment? It made all my symptoms worse. So the tiredness, the angriness, the sweatiness. It made everything worse. That... Certain noises really set me on edge. You now, like an um, edge cutter, for example. My brother was cutting the edge, and I couldn't stay there because it just made me feel awful. It's hard to explain. So that, that treatment having had to stop because you weren't responding, you then participated subsequently in a clinical trial in February 2012. Yeah. And um, um, that was ribavirin and ritanavir. And what was that experience like, that, that second course of treatment? When I first took it initially, the brain fog that I was feeling and experiencing, it was like it went... And I was clear. I could see for the first time in, in years. That only lasted a couple of days, though. Then I went back to my same. Right? So I was still anxious, still angry. Um, the moody thing, right? Uh, that was there. I was angry all the time. Um, it stopped my restless legs, stopped the itching, that's it. But that course of treatment did clear the virus? As far as I'm aware, yeah. One of the side effects you suffered from the antiviral therapy was an exacerbation of dental problems. Yeah, lost my teeth, lost my teeth. Um, out of courtesy, I'd say to the dentist, oh, I've got underlying illness. And once I said that to them, I never got treated again. They'd, they'd go in and they'd talk to me and, oh, we're going to do this next week. And then I'd come in and nothing would, would happen. And in the meantime, I was losing my teeth. And once I lost my teeth, people looked at me differently. I felt differently, made me more angry and more frustrated. <coughs> and I was put into a corner by the system. And that's what made me more, even more angry. And you, you explained this in your, um, in your witness statement, Leroy. Uh, um, out of courtesy, you told the dentist you had HCV. Nobody ever explicitly told me they did not want to treat me, but their no. treatment of me changed. Yeah. 
I would get an appointment booked, would have to wait a long time, even when I arrived early. By the time I got to the dentist's room, they would talk to me about the treatment but, and then ask me to come back. They would look in my mouth and touch me with metal tools, but they didn't actually do any invasive work, which no. you say you desperately require because your teeth were falling out. No, they didn't do any put it. Not, in, not what required any kind of invasion, not at all. Now, what can you tell us about the, the psychological, the mental effects of the infection and the treatment? How did it make you feel, knowing that you had hepatitis C? I felt, at first, I felt dirty. I felt, what have I done? I must have done something wrong here. And angry. Uh, I, was, I was relieved when I found out what was actually wrong with me. But the, the main fe feeling I felt was I felt dirty somehow, that I'd done something wrong. Which I know I haven't, but I did. I felt dirty, and and the way treat with people treating me, like you mentioned it, and people can't help it. They do a little before they t still talk to you, but you could see that little step away from you, as if oh, they want to be contaminated by that person, and maybe that was in my mind, but I did feel that. And you've explained in your statement that you began to feel depressed. Mm. You felt isolated and you felt alienated from other yeah. people. Yeah. And has that continued since the virus has been cleared or have things improved? It's continued since it's been cleared. And the reason why it's continued since it's been cleared is because uh, I applied to the Skipton Fund yeah, for an interim payment. And it's partly their attitude and the attitude of my GP uh, that's made me still angry because there's no, there's no information out there about it and all the information out there is all negative. We'll, we'll go through that. Let's go back, first of all, to why you believe that the cause of your hepatitis C is, was a blood transfusion of some kind in 1982. And, and the, the first reason you believe that is because of a recollection you have of a conversation with a nurse yeah. when you came round uh, from um, the surgery. Uh, and what you've said in your witness statement, Leroy, is this. Um, I was told what had happened by the nurse. And you say, although it was a long time ago, I'm quite clear that the way the nurse explained the process to me made me believe that during the operation blood of some form had been put into my body. You say you can't remember exactly what she said because yeah. it's some 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, and all the more difficult to remember without benefit of my medical records. But you're left with a memory of some form of conversation yeah. which led you to believe you'd had a transfusion of blood of some kind. Yeah, because until that point, I had nothing, no... Nothing. And, and, and that's why it was relevant to me at that time because that had happened to me, right, because I'd never had a stitch never broke a bone and that was the first time it happened and like I said when I came round the nurse was explaining what had happened during the operation because I was unconscious so I didn't see anything but she explained and part of that she did say about bloods 100% and that's why it sticks out. And you also recall um, being told uh, after the operation information about your blood group which you'd not yes, previously yeah, been told before yeah. and information about having a condition of sticky blood. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the first reason why you think that that was the cause of your hepatitis C. And the second, as I understand it from your statement, Leroy, is you're confident there are no other routes of transmission. No, there isn't. You've never taken intravenous drugs. No. Nope. You've never had a tattoo. No. Nope. Or piercing. No. Nope. Or shared razors. No. Nope. Or had any other surgery. No. Nope. Or anything else that would cause hepatitis C. No. Nope. And then also you say you, you, you began to experience the symptoms that you now believe were attributable to the hepatitis C a, a couple of years after that surgery. Yeah, in the 80s. Right, but I was, at that time I was young, so I just bounced through it and ignored it to a degree. After I had the, the uh, beer and meal and says, oh, I might have an ulcer or something, don't eat spicy foods. I didn't eat spicy foods anyway because I was a veg, so I just carried on with my life. But as I said... As the years progressed, that restless legs, that moodiness, it continued. And, and to the end, where I was so tired, it's untrue. It's hard to explain. It's like, just tired all the time. And I'd never been tired. That's one thing. And it just got worse and worse and worse. Now, you've, you've observed that 
there is this absence of, of medical records for the relevant time. You, you have got quite a substantial quantity of medical records yeah. which you've provided to the inquiry. Yeah. Um, but what's missing are records from about 1979 through to about 1985. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exactly around the time when I had my operation. And there are three lots of records that you think should exist. Yeah. GP records, yeah. you've got lots of GP records, but there's a gap for that period. Yeah. Uh, and then in terms of hospital records, you've tried to get your records from 1982 from the Manchester Royal Infirmary. Yeah. What's the response been? Uh, one, there's been two responses. One response was uh, if the patient doesn't return up after eight years, we destroy, uh, destroy records. And the most recent one is... Uh, the hospital records don't go back to 1982. I and mean, I thought that was insulting. Um, and we've got one of those responses um, that we can put on screen. 2644016, please, Paul. And this is a letter from the Central Manchester University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust, November 2010, yeah. addressed to you, uh, and uh, it says... Health records are retained for eight years since the patient's last attendance. And your solicitors have also tried to obtain yeah. records from the hospital and been told the same thing and that yeah. the records no longer exist. Yeah. So no GP records, no, no hospital records. Uh, and you've also, in your statements to the inquiry, been very candid about the fact that for a period in 1982-83, a, a, a number of months, you were serving a sentence in, in prison. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, you were, in fact, in custody at the time... When I had the operation. You had the operation, because you'd just been arrested. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, you therefore hoped that at least there would be custodial medical records that might show yeah. some information about that time, but those no longer exist either. No. And you've observed in your statement, Lee Ryan, that you find it inconceivable that there are no records for this period of your life at all. And you describe it as hitting a brick wall in your, in your search for evidence. Yeah. Now that's had a number of consequences that you've detailed in your witness statement. It, it had for a while a damaging effect on your relationship with your GP and GP practice because you were angry that the records weren't there. Yeah. Although you've now rebuilt the relationship with the, with with the, the GP search, surgery. Yeah. It, it's... Uh, it's reinforced your sense of frustration and anger that having been infected, you lack the documentation to show it. Yeah. And it's meant you've been unsuccessful in your applications to the Skipton Fund and its yeah. successor. Yeah. And we'll just have a look at those, or some of the material from those applications. So could we have on screen, please, Paul, 264023. And we can see this is a letter of the 27th of July 2011. Uh, and it says this, we've re received your application form along with a letter uh, from the trust informing us your prison medical records have been destroyed. We also have correspondence from Manchester Royal Infirmary that confirms they no longer hold any information relating to the procedures that you underwent there. So there's no doubt that the records no longer God. exist. Yeah. It is with regret that I must advise you your application has been declined due to this lack of supporting confirmation that you required treatment with NHS blood or blood products prior to September 1991 and that this was therefore the likely source of your hepatitis C infection. Of course, if you do manage to obtain any medical records which confirm that you were treated with NHS blood or blood products prior to September 1991, then please return these along with your application form and we will consider it again. Yeah. You're not able to submit any further records because they don't exist anymore. No. So you appealed that decision, and we'll have up on screen, please, 2644024. This is a letter from the Skipton Fund Appeal Panel, and we'll look at the bottom of that page, um, the penultimate paragraph. In order to succeed on an appeal, the appellant must satisfy the panel that it is probable that is more likely than not that the infection with hepatitis C was indeed caused either directly through treatment with NHS blood or blood products before the 1st of September 91, or indirectly by contact with a person who was so infected. 
In order to be satisfied that this is the case, the panel will pay particular attention to the treatment records of the person concerned. And then it goes on to say, your appeal was considered by the panel at its meeting yesterday. And over the page, it says this, the panel reviewed the entire file of papers held by the Skipton Fund in connection with your application and all the additional information supplied for the purposes of your appeal. Just pausing there, your GP had submitted uh, correspondence uh, uh, in support of your application, yeah. explaining that, amongst other things, you've always been very clear that you'd had this yeah. surgery, uh, although the records of the, the surgery itself don't exist, and that the, the, there was no um, knowledge or evidence of any alternative cause for the hepatitis C. And then the letter continues, we noted that there was no record of any transfusion in your notes. And that's presumably because you don't have I any don't notes. I don't have any notes, no. Uh, and then it says, our expert members were of the view, supported by the clinical records we've seen, that there is insufficient evidence to show that you were treated by a blood transfusion. And then it continues, the panel considered it was highly unlikely that the surgery you underwent to have glass removed from your knee would cause sufficient bleeding to require a transfusion. Yeah. And if we just go back to the circumstances of your surgery, um, we've seen the photographs of the scarring, yeah. but this was surgery that left you in hospital for some 10 days or two weeks. Yeah, because um, the glass, say that's my kneecap, and it went behind my kneecap, so when it's bent, so when I straighten my leg, the glass broke off behind my kneecap. And so when I moved on it, it caused damage to my knee. So it wasn't a simple operation. It was a case of cut, not, no bleeding, open up like a pie, take it out, put it back. It's quite a complex operation and that's what the nurse when I came round was on about and because I didn't have to remember I remember the vague details and it was only once I come back and I got hepatitis C that I went back to that because that's the only source that I could have got that hepatitis C. Now if we just look at um, a, a couple of further documents you'd ask, you asked your MP for assistance yeah. Uh, and we have a letter that the a Minister at the Department of Health wrote to your MP. It's 2644020. And it's a letter dated the 24th of July 2012 from Anne Milton uh, to the MP. And bottom of the page, near the bottom half, it says, The Skipton Fund can approve claims only where claimants can provide the necessary supporting evidence. It's for the fund to decide on the balance of probabilities whether an applicant has provided enough evidence to support their claim for a payment. Officials have contacted the Skipton Fund and established that evidence other than hospital me medical records can be considered when claims are made. Examples are GP records. You don't have any GP records from that time. Letters from solicitors or police. Mr Scarlett was involved in a road traffic accident. There may have been criminal proceedings. Is there anything that you've been able to locate that would... No, uh to be honest, yeah, I didn't contact the police or thing because uh, I was frustrated because it took me quite a while to get to see me MP. And, and I believe, I felt that I was being sent in the wrong direction because what I wanted was, uh, was open for that they actually investigated the lack of my records because I thought, surely there are some records and nobody wants to track back. And then it refers to any look-back letter that you might have received from NHS blood and transplant about a possible infection from a blood transfusion. Just pausing there, your surgery was in 1982, yeah. and the hospital says that it destroys the records after eight years. Yeah. So that would have taken you to 1990, and they'd have been destroyed at that point. I don't believe so. If the so. hospital is correct in if what the, it says. If, if, if the hospital is correct, yeah. Um, uh, and then if we go finally to... Uh, 264426, please. You renewed your application to the Skipton's replacement, EIBSS, and we can see that uh, uh, relatively recently, December of last year, um, they refused your repeal, uh, again, on similar grounds, lack of records, yeah. no supporting evidence, yeah. and, and the same kind of observations about the, the operation. Yeah. And what you've said in your witness statement, Leroy, is... You feel you're in a catch-22 situation? Yeah, I do. And you've said this. I'm still hitting my head against a brick wall, given the recent position of EIBSS. It seems irrational to me, or at the very least unfair, 
that the lack of medical records can be a probative factor held against me when my records have been destroyed or lost for the entire period around my operation. It's not as if there's a complete set of GP records for this period and there's simply no mention of my operation or a transfusion. It appears that, in actual fact, what the Skipton Fund and now EIBSS require is documentary proof of the operation and the transfusion. This leaves me in what I can only describe as a catch-22 situation, given that my records have apparently been destroyed without my consent or knowledge and through no fault of my own. Yeah. And so as a result of that and the inability to prove to their satisfaction the causal connection between your surgery and your hepatitis, you've not received any financial assistance at no. all. And, and just more broadly, Leroy, can you describe in, in general terms how the infection and discovering that you've been infected and being, going through the treatment that you went through, how's that impacted upon your life? Well, um, like I said about being angry all the time, depressed, don't talk to anybody anymore because I'm angry and nobody seems to understand what I'm going through. And I've always felt that I'm on my own with this. And because I'm on my own, I'm more determined to get to the truth of this because, like, how can I have an operation, right? I'm being in hospital for two weeks and there's nothing at all, not no mention, no nothing, and yet I've got the physical evidence and... I just get, oh, that's a neat scar. Oh, go away. Do you know what I mean? Um, and one time I was sent for an HIV test as well. Yeah. No, I ain't got HIV, right? And when I got the negative, it seemed to me like the consultant, the person who gave me the thing, was disappointed that I was negative. And it's things like that that has made me continually angry and frustrated in how I've been treated. And, and you put it this way in your statement, Leroy, my family will attest that since my diagnosis over the last 10 years, I simply have not been me. Yeah. I was a single father to one of my sons, and he recognises the changes in me. I've isolated myself through my anger at the situation, and this saddens me. Yeah. Leroy, those are the questions I had for you. Is there anything you would like to add? Um, not really. Not, just that I um, should let people know Right, because people like me, right, living my life, going along life, know all the health issues, have these, like, nebulous little things wrong with me. And to go to my GP, to go to my doctor who's, who's got my care at heart, to be fobbed off by them. And, and there's more people like me out there that are unaware that they've got hepatitis C and they're just walking around because of the way the symptoms are. And when they do find out, like myself, after having it 30 odd years, I'm, I'm more this, the virus than I am myself, right? And they should be warned and, and should be made aware and be tested. That's all I have to say. Leroy, Mr. Locke, who represents you, has asked me to just raise one further matter with you, and it relates to your application to the Skipton Fund yeah. and to EIBSS. Has anyone from either of those uh, schemes? ever explain to you why your own evidence, your own account of what happened to you and what you experienced isn't accepted, isn't regarded as enough proof for their purposes? I think this, both the Skipton Fund and especially now IBIS, it's all about saving money, yeah, and it's all about hiding the, the effects it's had on the greater population. And for that reason, that's why not many people, especially like me, who were not being given anything, because if they get given anything, it's like, oh, there's him, as an example. And that is the reason why I got knocked back. And, and that's why they, they got rid of the evidence. Hospitals got rid of the evidence. Thank you, Leroy. The, 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 the last question which uh, Mr Richards asked was whether anyone had actually told you what their reasoning was. No. Thank you. Nobody had, no. no. we have only, I think, the letters you've received... Yeah, that's it. ...which, which don't explain why your own account is not enough. Yeah. I, I've been told that um, if I can get somebody that was there at the time to come forward, then they'd reconsider me. And, like, well, oh, the doctor, the nurse, who? You know? Thank you. Well, it just remains for me to thank you very much for, for coming to see us, and I... I'm, Sorry if your earlier travel difficulties made it uh, a more anxious day than it should have been. But yeah. um, thank you for your courage in um, coming forward. I'm glad I have come forward because uh, 
I look around, but there's only one person that looks like me here. And there's, but there's loads of people that are infected and don't know. You know? All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Well, that uh, ends the proceedings for today. Uh, tomorrow is 10.30, is it? So it is. Uh, and what do we have tomorrow? Um, we have, first of all, um, um, a, a, an anonymous witness, Mr M. Um, we then have Margaret Madden, and then we have two witnesses giving evidence to, together, Laura Ryan and Robert Ryan. Thank you. So tomorrow, 10.30.